This is sort of my general overview of the whole thing. What, what am I talking about? Like I've said, um, we need to be faster and cheaper and safer, but why is that? And it really comes down to this quote from Werner in 2006 about the way that Amazon.com was organizing itself then and the way that AWS organized. And this is one of the things that Netflix adopted as, as a theme. It's like, okay, they had to do cloud. Well, we should copy you know, the Amazon architecture. That's what we were trying to do in 2008 and 2009. Um, and we took this to heart. So that basically means that if you built the code, you own the code in production. You're on call for the code in production. And this is, ver this is the change, really, from running projects, which a lot of enterprises do. You have a pre former project team, and you work for nine months to get SAP upgraded, and then you throw it over the water operations and go work on something completely different for the next year. Right. And there's the ownership is sort of handed over to operations. So if you have that kind of handover, you're typically doing project-based development. The, the change in the way that a lot of people, a lot of startups work and a lot in the way that a lot of web scale companies work is much more product based. So you own the product. And if you divide the product into lots of different microservices, then you own your microservice. And maybe down to the individual developer that built this service, because you know, the, how big should a microservice be? Um, one of the answers is if it fits in James Lewis's head because he's, he's got a fairly large head, but that's the sort of, I mean, one developer can understand everything this service does, that's about the right size. If it, if it takes too many people to understand it, then they start colliding on each other as they want to modify it. So sort of break it down into chunks of one developer mind at a time. And you've got, you're building your system out of lots of microservices where everyone owns it and you own the evolution of it. It's very hard to get locked in and you're not throwing things over the wall to operations but you need platforms and tooling to support you. So there's, there's a different setup, there's different tooling when you work in this way. But really what we're talking about here is that you own pieces of the product and you own the, the quality and the SLAs to your customers and you build, your organization is built instead of producer-consumer relationships end-to-end -end, where each of those steps is its own little bounded context with its own set of microservices. So when you're in that transitional state, the developers have the a bunch of responsibilities. And one of those responsibilities is, well, we're trying to go faster. We want to release the code as many times a day as makes sense. And because I'm just controlling this one piece, I don't have to coordinate with anyone else to re-release my microservice. I can do it as often as I want, as long as I don't break my API. And I can have testing to make sure that I didn't do anything incompatible. So I can change the internals of my microservice continuously. This is one way we get to continuous de delivery. And quite often, you know, if you do a day's worth of coding, you'll check in at the end of the day and it'll be in production, you know, overnight by the next morning, it'll be gone through tests and be in production. So what we're looking at here then is, you know, this is DevOps and that the developers are now operating their systems. Um, they're doing continuous delivery, um, getting your code into production. You don't have meetings. There's maybe a tracking ticket, but there's no permissions tickets. You're not asking for permission. You're not going through any more than maybe a code review with somebody else in your team, right? So when you're in that kind of environment, it's very low friction for getting things out. And this is the agility that a lot of people are now looking for. And, but you need a lot of self-service tools and everything being API driven. And once you create APIs, you find the tooling appears because developers hate doing things twice, they'll write code to do it automa in automatically. So as soon as you get to an API driven infrastructure, you will end up with a platform just because developers naturally develop things to, to do that. Whereas if you sort of have the operations mindset, you end up with run books where everyone has to follow the, the process and, and file tickets. So we're trying to move away from that. And you can kind of measure your maturity along this path by looking at for every release that you do currently, how many tickets are there and how many meetings are there per release, right? Collect that as a metric, publish it somewhere as a graph, and try and make it go down, right? And, and the further you go down, the faster you get, right? So there's a little sort of chart of how long it takes to get a release out versus how many meetings and tickets there are. There's a, a very good uh, talk by um, Phil, Phil Casado, is it, from SoundCloud? Is he here? I think he was going to be here. Still here? Still here? Uh, he, he did a paper, a, a, a blog post on how they sped up everything at SoundCloud that came out last week. Really interesting 
sort of said they, their release process was, you know, whatever, 90, you know, 60 days or something, or 90 days from an idea to hitting production, and they gradually just took more and more steps out of the process until it was very automated. So what we end up doing then is each developer makes one change and then puts that into production immediately. And the tooling to put something in production now with, with sort of Docker and, and uh, writing code in Go and the sort of <coughs> current technology that people are using is that your build time is a few seconds, maybe less than a second for a microservice. And the time it takes to put that in a container is less than a second. And the time taken to test it is a few seconds. The time taken to put that in production is a few seconds. So your delivery pipeline is maybe less than a minute. And it's a plausible thing to do. Um, some analysis of the lifetime of Docker containers by New Relic showed that the most common lifetime for a Docker container is one minute. Right? The second most common lifetime is zero minutes. And then there was a long way down, it's like less than a minute, they just had one minute resolution. But, so these containers were appearing and disappearing in less than a minute. And then there was a way, way, way lower, there was sort of some stuff along the axis that was stuff that lasts longer than that. So this is a very different kind of workload than you know, going to the data center and racking up a machine that's going to sit there for three years. When you've got machines that, you know, instances, pieces of code which are living for very short time spans. Those are basically test environments that are being created and destroyed very quickly. But what you're really doing here is you're changing one thing at a time as you put stuff into production. And if that one change you made broke, it's very clear that you broke it. It happened then. It's this change that broke it. You don't have to go and figure out which of the hundred changes in this release interacted which of the other hundred changes and who was responsible for it. And it takes much longer to debug the more things you put in a release. So going faster means it's easier to debug and quicker to roll back and safer to try things out. So there's this whole speed up where the, the faster you go, the smaller changes you make, the faster you go, and the fewer failures you get. It's a virtuous circle. And if you ever get your QA team saying, we need more time for the, to test this release. You ever heard that? Has anyone ever heard that craze? Right. So the response should be, OK, we're going to release more often. Right? Not we're going to give you more time. We're going to release more often, and there'll be less in each release. Right? So we're, if we release twice as often, there's half as much stuff to test, and you will find that it's less complex, and you can disambiguate the problems. Right down to continuous delivery, where you're releasing, con you're releasing and testing everyone in parallel. Right. So that's, that's what happens. So, so we're giving everyone the freedom to release all the time, but now you're responsible for it. And this is kind of the Netflix culture, sort of summary from the Netflix culture deck, a freedom responsibility culture. You know, we gave everybody root password, but you better be careful what you do with it, right? Um, one of the responsibilities then is how much does it cost to run this thing in production? If you can, you guess you can start a thousand machines and leave them running for three weeks doing nothing, but that's not responsible. So how do you run systems in a way which is efficient? And that, there's several parts of that. Part is the development process. The lean development process is to try things out, but fail early, fail early and often. Um, the instrument everything so you can see whether things are working or not. Um, you're doing hypothesis-driven development. If you look, read the Lean Enterprise book, there's a lot in there about hypothesis-driven development. This is the way pretty much everything at Netflix is hypothesis-driven development. Um, you're, you're, you know whether the idea you had worked. So if, if you take 100 ideas and you divide them into thirds, um, a third of them will be great ideas that will make the product better. A third of them will have no measurable impact at all, and a third of them will make it worse. Right? That's just averages. Right? The thing is, you don't know which third's which. <laughs> and if you arbitrarily pick, well, these are the winners, and I'm not going to try the other two thirds, you find that only maybe a third of the ideas you picked will work. <laughs> There's a large number of counterintuitive things, and it's very surprising when you actually get to hypothesis-driven development, how many times your initial hypothesis is completely backwards. You know, I thought this was going to make it better, it makes it dramatically worse. Right. Well, this thing, yeah, we'll, just let, we'll try this, but we're pretty sure it's not going to work. Oh, crap, that was a huge win. Right. That happens all the time, and you have to keep remaking these hypotheses and trying to understand why things happen the way they do. So, other ways you can gain efficiency. If you look at um, what's happened over the last decade as we went from individual machines to virtualizing machines, what virtualization did was it started to consolidate all the CPU power, so your machines got busier, but your memory footprint shrank a little bit. Right? You still had the full footprint of every application there. 
When you look at going to containers, you're actually doing a little bit more CPU consolidation because you can oversubscribe the CPUs, but you're also avoiding duplicating all the operating systems, so you're saving memory there. But the biggest thing is that if you can start an entire application in a few seconds and run it for a minute and shut it down again, you're actually time slicing resources. So the number of, te in your test environment, you need many fewer machines. So it gets, it's a much more efficient way to run uh, test environments because the same set of you know, virtual machines that supports your test environment is not locked down to be running things for a long period of time. You're, you're throwing lots and lots and lots of tests into it. And at night, when everyone goes home, those tests aren't running and you shut the machines down. So you get, uh, you know, a lot of the savings come from consolidating and time slicing the ability to turn things off. So this, this is um, one of the reasons that we see you know, Docker, the idea of using containers really getting uh, a lot of adoption in enterprises because they solve some of the big problems that large shops have. The other thing is to auto-scale production to consume just the resources you need. Uh, and so Netflix on, on AMIs with the Amazon Autoscaler was doing this by the hour. Right? So every hour they would predict how many machines they needed for the next hour and they would scale up or down. But the, the, the work they're currently going on at Netflix, they built a Mesos scheduler, which takes an underlying set of machines that are scaling up and down by the hour, and they're running Docker containers in it that are scaling up and down by the second. So they've got a two-level auto-scaling scheduler they're working on there. Um, so Coburn's going to talk a bit about how Netflix operates efficiently at scale tomorrow. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things they do there, but this, the idea that you're auto turning everything off is how you run very, very efficiently. And then, how do we run more safely? How do we, um, how do we become more rugged? And you, you don't want to say unbreakable or, or, or secure because you know, nothing is unbreakable or secure. But if you have an iPhone, it's not in a case and you drop it, it's going to break, right? If you put it in a rubber case, it's more rugged. And the more rugged the case, you can drive something. You know, some of these cases are designed to be driven over pretty much, right? It's still, you're just incrementally making it stronger and making it more rugged. So think of it in those terms. So what can developers do about the fact that um, you know, we're, there's an increasing level of threat happening? It, you know, it's not going to go away. Um, it's not something that you can pass over to operators and say, take my insecure application, wrap it in a security blanket, firewall, and everything will be OK. Those don't work. Right? You have to embed security into your system. And you've got external threats, so you need to be using penetration test tools. We'll be talking about that this afternoon. Um, you need to manage your image supply chain, something that Joshua has been deeply involved in. Um, you know, the, the, uh, what's the provenance? Where, do, what, where does everything come from? How do you know it's a good thing? Um, you need to build hardened services that are immutable. If, if all of your, the, date, the, the code that you put on a machine is, is read-only on disk, you know, then it, you know, it's harder to get in there and mess with it if somebody breaks into a system. And you need to understand how to use roles and security groups and various ways of providing detailed permission to things. So those are sort of protecting as external threats. But there's also internal threats. You have to assume that uh, every key person in your company could have a compromised laptop with a little key logger and, and you know, somebody from you know, some country that wants your secrets stealing everything out of it. So you have to assume that, which means that you need to put people in roles that have minimum privilege and manage that. Uh, you need audit logs for everything that happens, and this gets easier to do in the cloud. If you're actually having sort of arguments about, you know, can governance and auditing, how do you do that in the cloud? The, those, the governance and auditing people in your company should be the first people that want to put it in the cloud because everything can be completely audited in the cloud. You, you've got a strong assertion that everything that happened in this account, you know it. Whereas in the data center, well, you kind of know it, but who here has a CMDB that's fully trustworthy? I mean, it doesn't exist. It's sort of CMDBs are, aren't even eventually consistent, they're never consistent. Right? <laughs> right? Right? Whereas if you look at, you know, AWS CloudTrail or, or the Netflix Edda service, it's, you know, it's a consistent view of exactly the current state of your system and the history of it. And the other thing is just to encrypt data at rest. You have to use keys carefully. You have to understand the root of trust. Where do you get your keys from? Because if you leave your keys lying around, you get compromised. I think I, I heard that if you, if you check some code into GitHub, 
uh, a project into GitHub with an AWS key in it, I think it's 10 minutes till that your, your system is you know, mining Bitcoin or something, right? It's, it's about a 10 minute lag from you checking a key in until being compromised now, right? So from an arbitrary check-in. So what this comes down to, um, something Jerry Chen talks about is developer-defined infrastructure, and that's kind of the theme for this conference. These concerns are, be are becoming developer concerns. Now there's, and there's another operable conference next week, it's more operator focused, but the, what the operations concerns are how do you build platforms to support the developers to do that. But today and this, this week, thinking about how do we build applications with these new concerns baked into the application tier and the, what, what do we need from the platforms and the components that we build those out of. All right, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, I think we're just about running a little bit late, but not too just about on time. Now I'm...